I'm heading out to meet with some biologists and volunteer anglers from Trout Unlimited Canada to understand better an enigma surrounding the Arctic grayling. How is it possible these fish have more in common with grayling from Siberia than with grayling located in the Hay River drainage? Today's trail leads me to a section of the Freeman River where the mystery of the grayling is as murky as the tea-stained waters these fish swim in. To get a better understanding of what these scientists are trying to unravel, we have to take a step back in time. Yeah, so the, the reason that these two groups of fish are so different probably has a very large historical component. And to really think about it, you, you need to consider the origins of grayling in North America. So grayling here probably came across the Bering Land Bridge starting around 5 million years ago, similar to many other plants and wild animals. And then once they reached North America, then they had to do the hard job of surviving through multiple glacial cycles. Current research is pointing to the idea that grayling actually colonized North America through multiple waves. And the first wave could have come from a population of fish that we would consider the Nahani lineage today. And then subsequent to that, there could have been waves of colonization from other populations from Siberia. So the longer the fish are isolated from each other, the more time they have to accumulate local adaptations and different genetic characteristics just through natural processes like genetic drift and mutation. These biologists are interested in determining whether or not there are genetic and physical differences between the fish living in rivers like the Freeman and Little Smoky to the more northern waters in the Hay River drainage. So right now, we don't know if you can tell them apart visually, right? So with genetics, we can tell them apart. We can do a genetic analysis and say this is, we call them uh, fish from this area, Beringia lineage, we think. And then up in the hay, we believe there's Nahani lineage fish. And right now, if you picked up a fish, we don't think you can tell them apart. But that's what we're trying to see. So with these digital photographs, we're going to see are they shaped differently? Do they have, uh, when have a larger dorsal fin or something like that? But we need to confirm that with a genetic analysis. So for sure we can tell them apart genetically, these lineages, and now we're trying to see, can we look at them morphologically as well? If there are physical and genetic differences in the Arctic grayling populations, that could affect how these fish are managed. So there is broad agreement on the need to protect variation. Variation is really important in terms of having good fisheries today. So locally adapted populations really do the best job at surviving in these habitats. So we want to make sure that we're, again, preserving the unique array of populations that we have. And it's also really important for having healthy future fisheries because by protecting intraspecies variation, that means at least some individuals will have the genes they need to survive new types of environments or maybe new diseases. So when fish look different, that's a clue that they may have different local adaptations. So for example, if they have different placement of their fins, perhaps they do better in different kind of flowing water environments than the other lineage. And again, that's really important for us to understand and then potentially manage separately. So the federal government generally works through a system of designatable units where they take um, a species and they try and see, should it be managed as one designatable unit? So for grayling, should you manage them all the same from the Yukon through Alberta, or should it be split up into smaller designatable units? And the way that you determine the scale of those units is by using a combination of information that includes genetics and morphology and other life history characteristics. The process of determining physical differences is pretty straightforward. Because there are two different genetic lineages of Arctic grayling, what we're trying to do is capture about 200 individuals per lineage and take their photograph. And from that photograph, then we can analyze it back in the office and see if they have different body shape. So that could mean different size and shape of dorsal fin. It could mean uh, a different head shape, for example. Okay, now that the fish is anesthetized, it's ready to be processed. So first I'll take a length, then I'm going to be putting it on this specially designed photo board, taking a quick snapshot, and then it'll, it'll go uh, right back into this bucket um, and then into the river for recovery. 
2951. And then I'll be placing it on the board, making sure all the fins are nicely displayed. Take a quick photo, and then it goes into back into the recovery bin. Being able to catch that number of fish for the study is a tall order. So biologists have turned to a dedicated group of angling volunteers. We're actually really excited about this project. There's a really good collaboration between a number of groups. We've got some folks from uh, Trout Unlimited Canada and the Northern Lights Fly Fishers. We've got some folks from McEwen University. Uh, the University of Alberta is playing a role and uh, we've got some volunteer biologists. So it's, uh, it's really good to see a number of groups coming together to help uh, pull together a project of this magnitude. So will genetic and physical differences exist between these Alberta-based grayling? Analysis of the data collected over the summer continues. Perhaps in the future, the mystery surrounding the Alberta Arctic grayling will become a little clearer.